Peter Verhusel was a risk taker. The 29-year-old was described by his friends as an adrenaline junkie always willing to look danger straight in the face. That was no different when he and his two fellow friends went cave diving in the Sturk Fontaine Caves of South Africa in the fall of 1984. Having dived at those caves several times before, Peter would have described himself as an experienced diver and caver. But that day, Peter was the most inexperienced diver of the group, and it would be glaringly obvious in the way he acted. Being very comfortable in his equipment and underneath the water, Peter was confident and prideful in his diving abilities. This may have been his undoing, as we will see in a little. The Sturk Fontaine Caves are about an hour drive northwest of Johannesburg, and ever since the early 2000s, they have been a tourist attraction to thousands. Having built a platform for visitors to walk about the cave, they are able to take paid guides that will take them all throughout the caves and show them what they have to offer. Although the beauty of the walls and several stalagmites have always been the attracting factor for this cave and remain that way decades later, in recent times some huge archaeology finds have been in the headlines as several important fossils were discovered. This cave is credited with providing an almost complete skeleton of Australopithecus, which dates back more than 3 million years, and is believed to be human's earliest dated ancestor. This find makes the cave pretty famous among scientists and brings alert to the cave's history. But before the cave was a tourist and scientific attraction, it was an open diving and recreation area, housing the largest collection of passages and underwater chambers in the area. One of the main features of the cave are the many underwater lakes it has, featuring large rooms of air which have many islands that peek out of the water, most of which were named, explored, and mapped by 1984. The group of men Peter joined that day were looking to discover the depth of the lake that was in Milner Hall, one of the many named chambers inside the cave. On the day of Peter's dive, according to his friends, their plan was to follow the guideline into the cave until it ended and simply turn around to exit. Looking at the walls and the other natural structures, they expected to be under the water for just under an hour. Carrying what they thought was more than enough gas for this duration, this dive should have gone off without a hitch. Entering the water midday, each man only brought one light fixed to their own body, and all was going perfectly fine during the first portion of the dive. Peter took up the rear of the group as they threaded their way through the complex passages ahead of them. Towards the middle of the cave, one of Peter's diving buddies noticed him going off the line down one of the many offshoots. Quickly alerting the other diver, they waited for Peter's light to return from around the bend that he just swam around. Thankfully, after a few moments, the light returned and he swam back to the group swiftly. One of the five golden rules of cave diving is to never enter the cave without a guideline that will take you into and out of the cave safely. And most importantly, never leave the guideline or at very worst, the sight of the guideline. Knowing this, Peter's friend motioned to him that he needs to stay on the line if they're going to continue. The group then continued down further into the cave. Peter, having his own ideas in his head, clearly ignored these demands of his friends and left the line again just a minute later. Going down another passage to the group's left, he did quickly return. The two friends didn't think much of this as they all knew the rules and clearly indicated to him to follow them. As they continued down the cave, he would leave the line once again. It was on the third venture off the line that was Peter's last. The two men noticed Peter going down a smaller passage to their right, and as he turned the corner, his light slowly faded away. That was the last they saw of Peter. The passage he went down turned out to be a maze of dead ends, and Peter quickly found himself lost. Trapped alone and having no idea how to get out, Peter was looking for a way back to the main line. Realizing he burned through most of his gas, Peter was very lucky to find himself in one of the earlier mentioned underwater lakes. He was on an island inside a cave, hundreds of feet underneath the surface of the earth. Having a little bit of relief from knowing he wouldn't drown that day, he had no gas left in his tank to swim out. His only option at this point was to wait for rescue that was hopefully beginning. Peter's dive buddies would trail him into the passage after not seeing him return, but they were unsuccessful in finding him as they didn't know they were looking for him to be out of the water. Peter waited for hours before he gave in to his own exhaustion and fell asleep. Waking up to what he thought was the next day, no help had come, so he waited and waited in the pitch black cavern with nothing to eat, drink, or do. It was only six weeks later that rescuers found Peter laying next to his diving equipment on the very island that first saved his life. Looking as though he starved to death, Peter was in the rescuers' words, clearly recently deceased. 
The rescue crew noted a message scratched into the sand just at his feet. As Peter was dying, he realized it was the end and left one final message to his beloved wife and mother, reading, I love you, Cheryl and Ma. The rescue crew not only recovered Peter's body, but it finished surveying about 900 meters of new passages within the cave. Many still believe that Peter may have died within days of the rescue crew finding him, but the autopsy suggests that Peter died of starvation after just three weeks. Police released a statement after the dust settled that the divers who searched the whole cave system for weeks believe they passed within 40 yards of the exact island Peter was stranded on several times during the search, only to find him after a month and a half. As a result of this incident, the cave was shut down to divers and has not been dived ever since that rescue crew left the site. In a tragic bit of irony, the one piece of information the rescue crew and survey team didn't get was the depth of the lake Peter and his group set out to discover that day. To this very day, we do not know the depth of the lake that sits at Milner Hall. While this incident occurred in the mid-80s, diving and especially cave diving precautions and rules have since been cemented and understood as a necessity if you want to return with your life every dive you set out on. This story, as well as many, many others, have helped divers around the world understand how important following the golden rules of cave diving are. Having this much disregard for the rules is a death wish and should be avoided by everyone who dips their head under the water. Peter either didn't respect the inherently dangerous hobby he partook in that day, or he didn't care. Either way, the result should be a constant reminder of the stark reality of cave diving. That is the story of the diving disaster at the Stirk Fontaine Cave. If you want to hear more scary fascinating stories, make sure to watch last week's video.